All right, looks like we are live. Welcome to Ben There, episode 21, Lucky 21. This is going to be uh, a treat, and uh, I'm excited about this, as I'm always excited about everyone. I know I say that every single time, but this is this is going to be uh, a fun one. I want to uh, begin, if there's any first-timers out there watching, this is a show about people, first of all, but it's uh, specifically about those of us that grew up in a cross-culture environment also you know third culture kids those of us that grew up outside of our passport country uh, my guest today really doesn't need an introduction but i'm going to give her one anyway she is miss bertha pan she is also a ts alum and we'll get to that in just a little bit but she's uh, an award-winning writer producer and director who his films include face which uh, again Br bertha Correct me if I'm wrong, but this uh, premiered at Sundance Film Festival in 2002. Uh, it went on to win multiple awards throughout the film industry. Uh, but she was that was co-written with Oscar nominee Oren Moverman. And then she also wrote Almost Perfect, which featured actress Kelly Hu, Ivan Shaw, also TAS alumni Christina Chong, which uh, and Golden Globe, sorry, Golden Globe and Emmy nominee Tina Chen. She, oh, also, I don't want to forget, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Roger Reese, which was a Tony Award winner, he was also in that film, which I watched last night. We're going to get to that. Uh, but also, Lucy in the Sky, I want to talk about that in just a little bit, which featured SAG winner Catherine Curtin, Tony Award nominee Danny Bernstein, Zoe Coletti, Kelly Hu again, and Oscar Golden Globe Emmy Grammy winner Whoopi Goldberg. I can't wait to talk about that. But Bertha received her uh, Master's in Fine Arts from Columbia University. And she is also uh, the winner of the Directors Guild for Best Asian American Filmmaker. I probably could go on and on and on and on, Bertha. But I want to. I want to have you first of all welcome to the show, Bertha Pan. Thank you for doing this. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. It's no, no. An honor to be here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. So I appreciate that. But yeah, usually I start these off, and it's kind of what you and I talked about off air. Uh, but if you could just kind of reflect back, maybe the last twenty years. And just tell those that are watching, those that are going to be watching on replay here, what you've been up to. I know, but I want to. I want to make sure people know what you've been up to for the last twenty years. So, trying to see if I can even count that far back. But, <laughs> uh, so, TAS, and then I came to the states for college. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to Boston University. I was already actually working part-time in the entertainment industry, even before college. So I kept up with that freelancing. And, um, and then I was on academic probation after the first year. As me or me, you and I both. Don't tell my parents, but yeah, yeah you and I both. But <laughs> oh, well, my parents already know. Okay, okay and, go ahead. Um, and I was also working in nightclubs at the same time. Wow. Okay, I wasn't doing that, but yeah, you went. Um, and then I moved to New York City. Um, I was working in the music industry and uh, distribution, and then I started Columbia Film School. Was still working, flying around, working in distribution, and then uh, my thesis film at Columbia as a directing major ended up winning the Directors Guild Award and got some traction from the film festivals and so um and agencies and recognition blah blah and so i started working on my first feature and that was face and in the meantime i was working freelancing and production gaining experience um, and face premiered at sundance as you said and i was working with a lot of hip-hop artists so naughty mm -hmm. by nature wrote the theme song um, the root, the hug from the roots. He scored the film. Um, Most deaf, Black Eyed Peas. I had a whole Farrah Munch, um, Chops of the Mountain Brothers. Um, I worked with a bunch of Far Side, um, some Kid Trey from Far Side, um, some of the ex extended family of the Wu Tang Clan, um, and I also freelanced on uh, this. HBO series Oz. I worked on it for on and off for about three seasons as a dialect coach. And that's about it. Well, yeah, and then the rest of it are the other movies that you talked about. So. Yeah, we're gonna that's about it. I love that. That's <laughs> no big deal. 
And I just hung with Wu Tang crew. Yeah, we're good. Good clan. So, uh, well, listen, because you you were born in the states. I want to make sure we talk about that. You were born in New Jersey. Yes. Okay. New Brunswick, New Jersey, St. Peter's right. Hospital. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I like I like the attention to detail. That's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, so you ended up you born in New Jersey, and then you went back to Taiwan. You were basically raised there. We're gonna get into this in just a little bit. The way this show works, uh, Bertha, is that I usually talk about the, the TCK stuff, the first part, and then we, we move into the professional, what are you doing now kind of thing, the second part. But I want to I wanna touch on these TCK things because it, you're, you're – I haven't had – I'm trying to think right now, but I don't think I've had a guest that's been in your exact situation where you were born in the States, moved back to your – I'm assuming your parents are Taiwanese. Is that is that fair? I don't, I don't know. That's a – I mean – they were born in China and then okay. they moved to Taiwan um, in in their childhood. Okay. And then they studied in the States and okay. then worked here in the States and had my sister and I. Okay. And then we moved to Taiwan. But at the time, yes, uh, my dad's parents and my mom's dad at the time were living in Taiwan. Yes. Okay. So you ended up in Taipei. That's you know, and, and you were there through your entire, basically your entire childhood. You started in the states and then went over there. Yeah. I can't wait to talk about this because we're going to get into the school, uh, your your whole schooling in just a minute. But you ended up going to local school and then you ended up in international schools. You came, you graduated from Taipei American School. Uh, that's what our connection is here. And and then you came back to the states, went to Boston College, went to Columbia, Boston University. Uh, ooh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Um, but you, you've obviously been all over the world throughout what you do as, you know, as a professional here, but too, but it's the number one question people that grew up like we did always get asked. And that's why I like to just start right away with this question in your opinion and, and what you, you feel, where is home to you? I mean, I know you've been in stateside, but where's, where's home to you? Um, at this point, New York city, cause it's the mm -hmm. longest I've ever lived. Um, by far. So I've been in New York since 93, nine. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. my math is not so That's all right. <laughs> defying okay. stereotype right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you, you, you could say that. I was about to say something, but I'm glad you, you, you <laughs> took the bait there. So yeah, go ahead. Um, so, yeah, so New York city is home. Okay. And is it good? Specific. Say that one more time. West Chelsea. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you, in your opinion, though, do you do you, now that you've, I guess, been gone and but also at the same time traveled? Do you go back to Asia a lot? Yes, okay. I. My parents still live there, and um, in the last uh, eight years, mm -hmm. I've had a lot of work um, that is either um, based in Taiwan or China. So. I've been okay. doing a lot of traveling a lot to Asia. Specifically China, Taiwan, or just all over Asia? Um, China, Taiwan, Hong Kong a little bit. I love Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that later too, but I, I still love Hong Kong. It was my, my first dip in the pool of Asia when I was seven years old, but we'll, uh, we'll talk about that. So let me get to the next question then. If, uh, you know, born in the States, raised in Taiwan, you know, you ended up at an international school. Then you came back to the States. Uh, you know, you've lived a life between cultures. In your opinion, what are the positives and negatives about growing up that way? About, you know, technically, you know, being a TCK, you know, it, there's definitely good things that come about. There's definitely some interesting things come about. But what was your experience like? What were the positives and negatives about being a TCK? Um, you know, after getting your invitation, I had to look mm -hmm. up what TCK meant. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's, so did I. So did I about 15 years ago. So yeah, <laughs> relatively, nobody talked about it when we were growing up that way. So yeah. Um, so well, I I think it's not just between national cultures, right? Because when when I when we lived in New Jersey, I had already started um, preschool and. Uh, nurse at the time it was called nursery school and kindergarten mm -hmm. um, and so I was reading and writing um, and then I started first grade in Taiwan and that the elementary school that I attended it was a private school and mm -hmm. so um, 
So from first grade to sixth grade, my friend's parents were doctors and lawyers and bankers. But then the second semester of my seventh grade, I transferred to a public school. And so suddenly my friend's parents were they're very different vocations. And um, so there's that culture too. But then also it's when we moved to Taiwan, it was under martial law. And so suddenly it's like, wait, you have to wear uniforms. We have to <laughs> raise the flag every morning and yeah. we have to bow to the Chiang Kai-shek statue every time we walk by. We have to bow to the teachers before every class, the beginning and the end of each class. And the teachers were, you know, had bamboo sticks. And <laughs> corporate yeah. punishment was common at the time. Yeah. Wow. And, um, and then by seventh grade, we all have to cut our hairs and the officers come and measure with the ruler. And it could only be whatever, two or three, I can't remember, centimeters under below your ears. And then no bangs allowed, no layering, no perms, no coloring, no jewelry. And, yeah. you know, and then I also went to an all girls private boarding school for a year. And that was a whole other, and it was uh, a private Chris, Catholic or Christian boarding school, and it was all girls. So that was a whole different culture again. And in in Taiwan, yeah. And oh wow, I didn't even I didn't even know they had those. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so that was the year before I transferred to TAS. So okay. TAS was the final stop for my junior yeah. and senior year in high school. So it's just like all these different cultures even just within a tiny little island you know yeah. and um so you're asking what the pros and cons are from mm -hmm. um i think for me personally um the pros were that i um it's really informed how it's informed my work now because um in film production or television these days um you have to Basically, especially as a director, you're dealing with hundreds of people, most people probably more talented and more experienced than you, and yet you're the director. And so it's important to get into every situation and use the shortest amount of time because every second costs money. But to, to be able to read people and then figure out what's the most efficient way to bring the best out of each individual that is the most relatable or comprehensible to them as individuals. And so moving around so much, transferring schools so much and being in so many different cultures and having to immediately assimilate, it, it really honed in on my observation um, abilities to just, you know, each new environment, just sit back and observe and figure out the dynamics, the personalities, the power um, structure yeah. and then figure out how to best fit in in the most efficient way possible. So, um, so that's, I think those are the pros and, mm -hmm. and also just being exposed to at such a young age to so many different cultures and um, different you know, classes and different um, uh, types of people from all walks of life. Um, and the con, I guess, maybe you can relate to this as well is just having this condition of always being a moving target mm -hmm. because you're gonna, you know, it's like everybody can be my best friend, but <laughs> next thing I know, I'm gonna be in a new environment and yeah. be all, you know, completely new dynamics, new friendships, new relationships. So, um, so it's also trained me to be somewhat of a commitment folk. <laughs> No, I, I totally get that. And it's funny. Yeah. Cause I agree with you. The, the one constant with us cross culture kids and TCK kids is always, you kind of bittersweet in a way, but you always, it, you know, you, you get kind of become a master at saying goodbye. Right. You, and it's, I'm not, I'm not saying it's always a great way, but you've kind of, you know, you've mastered the art. Let's put it that way. Maybe of saying goodbye. Uh, Cause we I do it so much. Of you. I just, I've, 
just slip out. Like, oh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <I tell you. laughs> which is fair too. No, I, I totally understand that too. I get that because I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell you I shook hands and said goodbye to everybody. But yeah, it's just it's what we do. It's it's the lifestyle that we you kind of becomes part of your DNA. It's in, in that second nature almost. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong or, or you know, positive or negative. It's just how yeah. we go about life. It's just the way we view things. So um, that's awesome. Sorry. Peace out. I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to remember the peace out thing. So <laughs> <laughs> that was good. Um, no, and I agree with you totally. But uh, yeah, that's that's wild. But as uh, you're Asian, obviously Asian American, but the difficulties, you know, when you went back to Asia, you were you were pretty young. You know, we, we talked about that off air. But do you remember the difficulties going back to the Asian Asian culture and, and acclimating to that Asian culture after being in the States for a few years, born in the States and living in the States? What was your, was there a culture shock? I mean, I mean, you were pretty young. I think you said first grade when you uh, went back, but yeah, was there a culture shock? Could, what can you tell us? Any, any things stick out in your head specifically? Yeah, major culture shock. And as I was saying, you know, with the martial law, all those as a seven-year-old, it was just so hard to comprehend. I was terrified of going to school every day. And mm -hmm. I just, I missed the idyllic life of suburban New Jersey and mm -hmm. my backyard. And um, I walked to the school bus and, you know, school life in my mind in America was very free and open. And here is like military and, um, um the, the militant structure and uh, and um demands were were really foreign to me and mm -hmm. and um when you were talking to me earlier i was thinking about how shortly after we moved to taiwan that was when president carter um signed the treat treaty with the people's republic of china and severed relations with the u.s embassy pulled out of taiwan mm -hmm. and so and and so all the kids in my elementary school they knew i was from the states and america was was americans in the u.s were you know it's like treated with rotten eggs and rocks and and so um and so these kids who don't under, don't know any better, they were calling me these crazy names that I couldn't wow. even understand what they what they meant. And uh, and then meanwhile, because um, at that time, in front of each classroom, there's a each class makes a like a monthly um, arts and crafts board, and the school assigns the theme. And so that month, the theme was about creating this um, this piece of artwork that 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 brings up this that President Carter the US was um, oh, wow. getting yeah. hoots with the China communist Chinese communists and so and I because I was drawing a lot they made me draw <laughs> a huge cartoon of pres like a caricature of President yeah. Carter and then like this description of that, I guess it's supposed to look like a bandit, but that's the oh, wow. communist. Yeah. <laughs> and I, as a kid, I had no idea what any of this meant. And it was just very confusing for me. And even um, my, we were living with my grandfather and he um, had a subscription to Time Magazine. And and because it was in English, so it was easier for me to read. So I would flip through yeah. the magazine and there were these words or it's like articles or photos that would just be marked over with these with a black Sharpie. Oh, so wow. it's, it, and at the time, because I had no frame of reference, mm. it's not till recent years I'm thinking back like, holy crap, some, that was actually someone's job to go through, <laughs> go through yeah. magazines and you know, yeah. whatever is censored. That's wild. So did you, when you were in those schools and the public schools, when you first got to Taiwan, did you view yourself as an American? I mean, like, cause obviously, I mean, this respectfully, you looked apart, but intrinsically, I mean, did you feel more American or did you feel like, okay, oh. this is, this is my culture. These are my people. Like, how did that, how did that happen? Like, how did that feel? I guess it's. Mm, I think I 
felt more American mm -hmm. uh, at the time. And also, um, uh, by the time I moved to, we moved to Taiwan, um, I had already had like American milk, American, <laughs> yeah. American yeah. protein. Yeah. And yeah. at the time in Taiwan, the kids are, were not, were, were smaller framed and mm. smaller and especially the girls. <laughs> so I was towering over the other girls and bigger bone and darker skin. So oh, wow. yeah, I didn't really, um, I, I didn't look the part as much yeah. as I would have liked to. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's, yeah. Wow. That's, I, yeah, that's a whole different experience that I, I can't even relate to. That's, that's amazing. So. And wow. also at that time, speaking of milk, mm -hmm. that was a huge thing that we were very unaccustomed to as well, which was, at the time, it was it was most it was all um, powdered milk. Mm -hmm. Oh so wow! I'm used to rich, mm. milky milk. From Two percent whole milk. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get. It. I totally. Milk. <laughs> I, I totally get it. So wow, um, that's wow. That yeah. Uh, so your internet. Let's let's then progress to your international school experience because you ended up at Taipei American School. Uh, which is where I, we were there at the same time. Um, I, I moved there. I'm trying to think. We moved to Taipei in 1986, which it sounds like that's when you transferred over to Taipei American School. Uh, your international experience compared to that local school experience, what do you remember specifically about TAS versus, you know, going to local schools, growing up, that side of it versus the international school experience? Um. Well, everyone spoke English, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dwayne, yeah. yeah. Yeah, there you go. Um, and yeah, it was just, it, um, it was like uh, an American school in America where no uniforms were needed. And mm -hmm. it's, you know, you get to choose your own classes instead of all the um, mandatory um, pre assigned courses. And it was more about really um, um, ex exploring and learning about yourself and finding out what it is that you enjoy and where your strengths and talents were focused, you know, versus mm -hmm. stuff, versus reading, studying just to pass exams. Um, did you did you feel more relaxed or more at home, so to speak, when you went to TAS versus being at a local school? Um, definitely more relaxed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think I think it's easy for me. There's always like this at any school and every school and even now every new environment. There's like a warm up period where I'm mm -hmm. on the outside looking in and observing. I'm reading yeah. people and reading dynamics. And then yeah. I feel immediately, by the time I jump in, I feel very at home already. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter any type of environment. I feel, I think I can feel pretty at home easily. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so there was the warm up period and then yeah, totally at home. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, and, and the funny thing is I get that because that's, that's kind of how I felt when I came back to the States. You know, it was, I looked the part, I was supposed to, to fit right in. I'm six foot two, I'm a white guy and everything was supposed to just be easy. And yet yeah, I love your, your, your description of kind of almost outside the box until it's, you feel that safety. Yeah. Right? Cause that's, that's exactly how I was. And ironically, it was more coming back to the States. Um, but it was that you stand outside the box and yet you're where you're supposed to be, but it's, it doesn't feel right. You know, in, in turn, you know what I'm saying? It was just, it's, it was such a wild, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But when I went to college, that's exactly how I felt. It was outside the box. And even to this day, there's certain moments that I still feel outside the box until mm. you kind of, you kind of get your wings. You kind of feel, okay, you can trust all that, all that stuff. And that's, that's, ex it's funny to, to hear you say that about your experience in Taipei and at TAS versus my experience coming back to the States. Very similar. Two different cultures completely, but very similar in terms of feel, right? So, Where did you go 
to college. <laughs> My uh, my first two years was in Brevard, North Carolina, which if you say who, where? Yeah, it's exactly right. So um, it's right outside of Asheville, North Carolina, but it was a small school. I wanted to play baseball. You know, I had this this the baseball dream and all that. And I did. I ended up playing for the college, but uh, it was oh. a very small town. Um, it was one of those things where I could either go to the colleges that I got into and, and put the baseball career on hold, or it was go to a very small school that was allowing a couple walk-ons here and there. And this is back, this is going to date me, but this is back when there was no internet, there was no anything like that. So there was no way for me to reach out to coaches yeah. other than send. I remember sending my parents sending VHS tapes. <laughs> yeah, right. We would, they would take me together. Yeah, Betamaxes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. They would send, they would send, uh, they'd watch me, they'd film me playing, you know, baseball in Taiwan and then they'd film that. And then, and we'd send those off to, to, you know, universities and colleges here stateside got nothing back. No, nothing, you know, no letters of, yeah, we like what we saw anything like that. So it was one of those things I knew I was going to have to walk on. So I figured my chances were better if I went to a small school mm. as opposed to a big school. And so, uh, we went to North Carolina first and then right away I got hurt, which I'd never been hurt my entire life. I popped my knee and it was kind of one of those things that didn't tell anybody for a while, but that's a whole other story. But yeah, I went to a small school just to play baseball basically. And then I down in the dumps transferred to Boise state, uh, finished. I'm from Idaho originally. My family's from Idaho. So, uh, ended up at Boise state. I went to Boise state on crutches cause I just had knee surgery right before. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was just the perfect storm of, wow, who's this guy? Um, but yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, I totally can relate to that. And even when I got to Boise state, I've told the story a couple of times. It was, it was funny because when I got to Boise state and even in, in North Carolina, they had an international, international student club and the president of the school welcomed everybody in. And I, I kept getting invitations. Uh -huh. And even when the lady would come and give me the invitation, she's like, I don't think this is for you, but for some reason we have you down as like an international kid. And I'm like, <laughs> She's like, I don't know. I, she, my last name obviously is German. So she's like, I don't know if you're German, if you grew up in Germany, but welcome to America. I'm like, well, actually I'm, I'm American. And she's like, well, maybe we're wrong. And so she would go back and forth and check and make sure that she had the right person. Sure enough, I because on my application, just like you, everything was Taiwan. My parents' address was Taiwan. You know, everything was Taiwan. And they're like, this can't be right. Here's, here's a six foot two white guy. Like, why is he? Ha they didn't understand. But I... But the funny part is, I guess what I'm getting at is I would go to those international student groupings and, and barbecues yeah. and things like that and feel more comfortable with that mm. and with those folks than I did with the, my own baseball team, who was, you know, great guys, but they were basically local kids. And, and you know, I always felt like outside the box. Yeah. Fast forward a couple of years and when I went to Boise State. It's so funny how this, it just kept, it, it follows me. And at the time it, it bugs me, but now I look back with a badge of honor, but I would get, I got to Boise state and when I moved in the dorms from Boise state, I was a little bit ahead of everybody. I got put in a freshman, sophomore dorm, even though I was a junior, but I didn't care, whatever. But my roommate at the time was an Asian American kid from Twin Falls, Idaho. And his parents had a uh, Chinese restaurant in Twin Falls, Idaho. And so his name was Manny Lee <laughs> still is, I'm sure. But he, uh, on the door the day of like welcome to your dorm and all that stuff they had my name and underneath it was a taiwanese flag huh. right and then on his name they had an american flag <laughs> right and so it was just one of those things that like here we go again people kept knocking on the door they couldn't wait to meet the international kid right. turns turns out i'm the international kid right. not right. many and so they were like hey welcome to the states talking to my roommate and he kept pointing over at me yeah. Right? So it was just one of those things like, like I had to, it, it just, but it, it is what it is. I, and I, I laughed about it at the time, but it's just who I am. It's my story. So, right. and uh, it, it's, but the point to that is I totally understand being outside that box until you feel comfortable, you know, and yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So. But it also hones and that's why you're a writer now. Yeah, totally. Just totally. But hones the yeah. storytelling craft, right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it's just uh, still, it's, 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 whether you realize it or not, you've got so many intrinsic stories that I think are, it's therapeutic almost to write about, you know, it's, it's therapeutic to get out. And it's, that's another reason we do the show is that we, it's people like us. We just have so many different 
ideas and that are brought about by how we were raised and what we've seen in, in life, you know, and people we've met in, along the way. So I do also feel like if you're at the center from the get go mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. at ease and expressing yourself, you miss out on a lot of stories, right? Whereas if yeah. you're on outside the box observing, that's when you get to learn about everyone and the stories and the dynamics and yeah. and the experiences. So therefore you have more stories to tell. Yeah. Did you ever think you were alone in those stories? Did I think I was alone in terms meaning, of meaning meaning you were the only one going through it? Uh, like when you, yeah. you know, when you got to Taiwan, were you the only one going through it? When you got back to the States, were you the only one going through it? Yeah, but I think that's also part of just being the whole like I'm an angsty artist. No one, no one understands me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've got that whole other side too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that just kind of feeds into it, right? So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah, no, because I always did, and that's what's been a blessing of this show. The more I've been able to talk about it, it's it's hearing other stories, whether they're similar to my exact experience or not, whether they're American or, or Dutch or mm -hmm. you know German or Canadian all these folks at some point shared a similar experience and it was just like mind boggling and mind opening to hear like, Oh, wow, I wasn't the only one going through this. This is a common theme with TCKs and people that grew up the way we did. Mm. It's refreshing. So non-artists, by the way, you get, you artists are a whole different, whole different thing. Well, you're a writer. That's in the yeah, best part. I know. I know. That's true. Have a show. This is art. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. Absolutely. What about acclimation back stateside then? Because now you had gone from being just into normality, so to speak, in Taiwan. You know, you go, you went through that whole thing with uh, public schools, private schools, and then TAS. And then after years, you came back to the States. How was the acclimation process once you came back stateside? I, well, there were a few different folds of the same story. Oh, do tell. Let me get comfortable because I, I have a feeling I have a feeling this is gonna be good. So well yeah. it was in in all the Chinese schools, because of the schooling and the um, the the national entrance exam system at the time. So you have to take a national entrance exam for high school and national entrance exam for university. So everything was mandatory, right? And every all your classes, all of your assignments are about um, bettering your score so that eventually you can advance into the next level of education. And mm -hmm. so I didn't, once I was in the States, I was like, freedom! And it was <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. had a little too much fun. And then on the other side of it was also, um, I, was in, I, I was in liberal arts and it's so much reading and, and I did do Chinese schools from first grade to 10th grade. So, I, and being a slow reader to, to begin with. So I was having, it, it, was, it was hard for me to keep up with all the assignments and all the reading. And I still remember actually um, at one point, it was just hundreds and hundreds of pages per week. And I just, I was so behind. And finally after class, I just went up to the professor and um, who's this, world-renowned scholar, I didn't know at the time, but um, but I said, I'm really sorry, but I just, I, I have a language barrier, but because my accent is American. Uh, right? So he looks to me, he's like, language barrier, yes, yes, don't we all? Every, from thought transferred into language is there's always a barrier. And from the <laughs> abstract to the concrete, there is always a barrier. And so I was like, no, 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 no you don't understand. I'm, yeah, so I had to explain to him why, yeah. was like, what? No, really, do, you know, do I have to talk like with a Chinese accent for you to understand? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, um, so there was that too. So, so the the combination culminated in um, academic probation. So. <laughs> I had no language barrier. I just didn't really care at the time. I was bummed out because I was my baseball career was over. <laughs> so, oh. yeah. Wow. That's, yeah. Um, 
But yeah, any other, like, in terms of an acclimation process, though, with friendships and things like that, how did that all work out? Were you, was it an easy transition in terms of getting back to the States and jumping right back into the American culture, aside from school? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, obviously. I was having a lot of fun. <laughs> That's true. I was going to say, if you had academic probation, you probably had a good time. So, But also, my, um, I was fortunate because... Well, first of all, one of the TASers um, who you mentioned, Andy Moriarty, he mm -hmm. went to the same university as well. Oh, yeah. So yeah, we yeah. got to hang out quite a bit. And then um, uh, the first person who walked into my dorm room and introduced herself to me, and we're still great friends now, she's half Mexican, half French, who mm -hmm. grew up in Mexico City, but um, was educated throughout her life in French schools. So it was, in a way, though different cultures, similar upbringing or similar, um, I guess, TCK experience. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so there is that too. And, and I think most of my friends were quite multi-culti. Yeah, so good. it was easy. And Boston University was such an international school anyway. BU, right? Is that what you said earlier? <laughs> BU. <laughs> Not BC, BU. <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, what kind of advice would you give uh, to those of that are currently in your situation? And what I mean by that is I can sit here and tell you the advice I would give to those that look like me. And, and again, I mean, mean this all respectfully. Those that look like me going on maybe to Asia, coming back to the States, I can, I can help those kids out. But what advice would you give to TCKs that are in your situation, you know, maybe born in the U.S., then went back and lived in their, you know, parents' culture, and then came back to the, you know, a different country, went back abroad for college, things like that. What kind of advice would you give to those kind of kids? I don't. Ooh, it's the deep question parts, right? It's a deep well, question. Ooh. I just don't know if I, um, because I feel like every. Human, every person is wired differently. And so mm -hmm. there's, I don't know if, and I did not adjust very well um, mm -hmm. when I moved to Taiwan. So, um, but also the world is a very different place than, yeah. than how it was back then. So now the world has gotten smaller because of the internet and, and um, because of education and, and news being more available. Um, I, so even when, um, when I went back to TAS a few years ago to talk to the current students about um, filmmaking and uh, Almost Perfect, the, my second film, um, starring fellow TASer Christina Chang Chang, um, Chong. It was like TAS is a totally different school and different environment and different feel than the TAS that we went to, right? So, so I don't know if I have any advice to offer other than just try to keep an open mind and take in all the experiences because they, it all enriches you as a person and, um, and be adventurous, be open-minded and, but also be willing to to communicate whatever struggles you're going through, and it's not necessary to hold it all in or think that you're the only one going through it, right? Yeah, so totally. It's there will always be some way or shape or form that is relatable to a fellow human being. So yeah. just have some kind of outlet. Yeah, I love that. I love that, and that's you and I kind of talked about that. That's one thing that it was just doing this show and, and talking to, to folks from all different backgrounds. That's the one thing I just used to think it was me. I thought I had an issue. It was just Ben Vogel. Right. And yet we all struggle. And what I love about what you just said is that we all struggle maybe, maybe on a humanistic approach, right? It's just, it's not necessarily maybe a TCK thing, but it's just a humanistic approach. And I love that. I love, I love those words. Um, a lot of uh, cross culture TCK kids have that travel bug their entire lives. I'm no different. I, if you had me, handed me a ticket tomorrow and said, here you go, I'd be first in line, all that stuff. Do you still have the travel bug? I mean, I'm sure with your profession, you probably travel a lot, but yeah. Yeah. Do you still, is that ingrained in your DNA like the rest of us? Or do you, do you love to travel? Do you hate to travel? What's, what's your story there? 
I love traveling. Uh, I'm this whole lockdown thing has been, you know, staying at home for five months straight. Uh, <laughs> I'm not yeah. used to this. No. <laughs> yeah, definitely love traveling and also yeah. um yes, yeah, so I travel a lot for work and then also my family is all over the world. My parents yeah. live in Taiwan and they spend Chinese New Year's in Vancouver. My sister works in London but lives in France. And that's only wow. your family, right? And then yeah. our relatives are all over. So um, so I do love traveling so, so much. And mm. I'm used to tra- being on the road for you know the majority of the time. But that also makes coming home to my own space mm. and to decompress and just zone out so precious. So I love being home as well. I love, yeah. not five months yeah. locked down. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's driving me crazy. I mean, I haven't even taken a road trip. It's just it's, this is folks like us that have just seen the world and, and, and are used to traveling. Like I'm not used to being in the same place for longer than a couple months, you know. So it's even if it's just a quick trip to, you know, I, I'm in Utah. And so I mean, even Vegas or Phoenix or any place like that. It's just a quick, Boise. I drive up to Boise all the time. I haven't been able to do that. And it's, it's just that's probably been the hardest thing for myself is just Talk about lockdown. Yeah, I just I, I'm used to having bags and somewhere to go or some direction or some plans, all that stuff. And it's it's been it's been a wild thing. And I think a lot of I mean, people are having a hard time throughout the world. Don't get me wrong. And there's people in a lot worse situations and conditions that we are. But but still, it, it doesn't make it easier. You know what I mean? It's just it's it's a matter of yeah. It's it's it yeah it eats at me because I'm just so used to being on the go, 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 go. And and yet at the same time, it's it's kind of I guess. I guess it's nice to maybe be home for a little bit and kind of explore those, those side or that side of, you know, life as well. But yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to hop on an airplane and yeah. <laughs> whatnot. So um, I do want to go ahead. Sorry. No, well, go ahead. You turned this time lockdown time at home into something productive. Cause that's how this yeah. came about. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe this was just uh, supposed to be a fun little thing. Yeah. And explore yeah. all these parts of you and your history and the commonality yeah. um, that you wouldn't have had the time or the, the mindset to even do while yeah. being on the road all the time. Right. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I've been writing a ton too, you know, and so that's, it's a blessing in that aspect of it. Totally. I, I won't even try to argue with you there, but yeah, in terms of the antsiness yeah. and the, the DNA in me that's used to going somewhere and having yeah. plans and things like that, that's, that's, it's been brutal, but yeah. Again, I'm I'm healthy. My wife's healthy. My family's healthy. People I know are healthy. So it's you know it's but it's uh it's tough. You know it's a tough time right now. It's something that we've never never been uh I guess accustomed to or used to. So but it is what it is. So I do. Before we switch topics, though, I do want to ask you. You brought up your sister. Do you think you know? I, I don't like to put you know words. I don't want you to put words in their mouth, things like that, and, and talk about your sister. But did, did she go through the same kind of feel as you do? Do you guys ever talk about that and in terms of growing up the same exact way? Um, not as much because okay. she was much younger when we mm-hmm. moved to Taiwan. So she didn't even um, – she had never gone to school in the States before. Oh, okay. And, um, and so she just started out from nursery school in Taiwan and then went to traditional Chinese schools and excelled in academics and sports. And she was way more well adjusted. (laughs) (laughs) And then, um, and then she actually went to England for a level. So the last two years of high school. And then she didn't, she didn't go to TAS. No, but even though people forget that she didn't go to TAS because she's friends with everybody. Oh, okay. Um, And, uh, and she probably stays in touch with more TAS people than I do. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah. Um, she went to Cambridge University. So she actually has, and maybe one day she'll be on the show, but she yeah. actually has the, a proper Queen's English accent. Oh, and really? That, she so you guys have two different accents. speak American. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're totally American. I hate to break it to you. But yeah, your accent's totally American. So, But that's wild. You guys have different accents. Yep, totally different. And so there was a time when she lived with me in New York after graduating from college. And mm-hmm. so this one day, this friend confronted me and he was like, 
I called your house and there was an English person who answered the phone who said you're she's your sister. I didn't know you have an English sister. That's so funny. Wow. Well, what does she do? What does she do these days? She's in France. She was trained as an architect. And okay. uh, so when she was living in New York, she was working as an architect. But she is now a fashion designer. She has her own line called Deploy. And um, it's all sustainable um, uh, and um, London based. Um, wow. Yeah. And she does pop up shows. Well, not during lockdown, but for years she was doing, she does pop-up shows all over the world. So that's also why she gets to see more TASP alums. Yeah. <laughs> they all, they're all her faithful customers as well. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have her, uh, we'll have to have her on, uh, on the show. So, well, this is the time we get to kind of flip flop and now we're going to step away from uh, the TCK thing. And, and I, I, I want to talk about your professional side and, and what you've been up to. Um, obviously you're an award-winning filmmaker. <laughs> it's, it, why are you laughing? Sorry. <laughs> is that still hard to accept or what? Like, uh, what? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, you are. It's, it's a fact. I can't, it's not me just, you know, making you feel better here. It's a, you're an award-winning filmmaker, but how did you get your start in film? Like what, what was the, the process there? Um, well, I actually started working in the entertainment industry um, since I was in high school in Taiwan. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and actually my first job as a 16 or 17 year old was uh, translating Whitney Houston's contract from English to Chinese. <laughs> Like so, a, when she came over to do a show or what? Like what? When the concert promotion agency was approaching her to do the show. Oh, wow. Um, wow. So I know actually all of her dressing room requirements. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so then I, the, 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 sh the, um, the concert, it didn't mm. end up taking place, but I stayed with the agency and I was working for them. So, so I was, exposed to show business um, very early on and yeah. working with quite high level international artists and producers and um, pop culture icons and um, culture makers. So, uh, um, and then, so when I came back to the States to go to college, I stayed, I still freelanced for the same agency and then um, also made some student films and how that came about was that as i was sharing earlier on because when i first came back to the states it was like freedom i can do everything and anything you know and it's not just shoved down my throat anymore and so it was my i just had so much so like my interests just ranged from from everything from from literature to philosophy to photography to music to film and i was a music major for a very brief amount of time too a minute, yeah. <laughs> all, but i was playing rock bands mostly you know i didn't want to the, the structure of classical music um and then it, it was just so many different things that i wanted to do i wanted to learn i wanted to explore and one day, the same friend I was telling you about, the half Mexican, half French girl, she brought me to her film class. And, um, and suddenly my eyes just opened because it was like, oh, film is one form where everything, even traveling, all of that can just enrich the storytelling, the frame and then, and, and the more you accumulate, the better. It's not like any of the other majors where they, you have to excel in this limited area and yeah. in order to advance. So, so then I started making short films and, um, and when I finished, uh, when I graduated from university, I started working for this international film distribution company here in New York. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, Taiwan and China, they were just starting to open up. And so there were um, 
I was in the right place at the right time. So at 22 years old, I was traveling the world, going to film festivals and film markets, negotiating deals that had numbers bigger than my brain could you know, <laughs> retain. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and uh, because people needed the American companies, the corporations, they needed someone who could communicate, read and write Chinese, and yet understood the American way. So, yeah. um, so yeah, you, you would have been perfect for it. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So I got really lucky and learned about the business and was, you know, shuttled right in that way. Oh. Do you, uh, where do you think your creative side came from? Was that, you think you were born that way intrinsically or like, what, what do you, what do you attribute that to? Uh, definitely. I mean, I don't know how creative <laughs> I am or yeah. I am creative. Um, because I you're, do. You're an award-winning filmmaker. I think you're pretty well, creative. Yeah. I, so. But I feel like the material comes, I'm just trying to capture real life, right? Characters and stories, they all come from life. So, so it's more about observing and then figuring out and learning the craft of how to tell the stories of yeah. these characters and, and these happenings in life. So is that creativity? Maybe, um, but it's not like making something out of nothing. Um, whereas I, I do feel like, for instance, what my sister does, um, or even my father, who's an architect, um, that that's really creating something out of nothing. And um, and my mother is a scientist, and so she, oh, wow. she's really creative as well, just in 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 terms of um, applying science in a very creative way, or doing research and um, trying to break new grounds or discover um, unexplored territory. And, um, and so even, I think even, I love both my sister and I love cooking so much, but we mm -hmm. never follow recipes. We never <laughs> follow cookbooks. It's all just from, you know, the way my, seeing how my mom, our mom used to do it, which is, it was like, like science experiments. <laughs> But it was really Absolutely. creative, and yeah. no no ingredient was ever wasted. Right? It's all very yeah. creative. So yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Uh, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, especially with food. Yeah, that's a that's a creativity in its own genre. There, that I love that. So um, you kind of you kind of beat me to the punch because my next question was: Have you always wanted to make films? Is that something that you was that always the plan? I mean, is that Something you, you you kind of beat me to that, but yeah, it sounds like you you've done a lot of things and you, you kind of going to that class and you're with your friend and kind of being exposed to that world. Um, I no, I don't. I've never been a go getter, and maybe that's from the whole TCK moving target um, upbringing. I don't know, but but I've more. It's it's always been more for me. I've, I I wander a lot and I just enjoy the process. <laughs> yeah. I'm with you. Trust me. I'm with you. Yeah. 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 You know, enjoy the uh, scenery and fix stuff up on the way. And um, so I think filmmaking ended up being, it's, it's like this blank screen, right? Over this canvas and then all of it, you can just eventually put into it. But that's why I ended up choosing going to Colombia, even though I was already in the entertainment industry for quite some years at that time, it was doing okay. But, um, but I wanted to learn the craft of storytelling. I mm -hmm. wanted to learn how to develop characters um, and how to be able to tell stories in a way that is compelling within the, the restrictions of the screen and of the 90 minutes or two hour or whatever. Yeah. So that's how, so I knew what I wanted when I eventually went back to school. I love it. I love it. Well, on that note then, how does your upbringing, especially being cross-cultured in a TCK, how does that influence your filmmaking and your creative side to the, your filmmaking skills? Do you think it does? I don't know because I've never been, I don't have any reference of, yeah. living a different 
of being brought up in a different way. So well, almost perfect. I mean, almost perfect kind of, you know, that kind of hit on, on some of the ways you were raised and, and tell the story about that. I mean, I, 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 you told me about it, but how did that come about? The almost perfect script, well, I guess. I think the, that's the thing with um, when you're both the writer and the director is that people think the story is autobiographical. So actually when my first film came out, Face, it was mm -hmm. about three generations of women raised in, um, from Queens, Chinatown, and uh, here in New York, and set in these parallels coming of age stories between 70s and 90s. And, um, and grandma was a bigot, mom was a deadbeat, daughter is kind of a, is kind of a bitch. Um, and she ends up having this relationship with the black, with the African-American DJ played by Chet from Naughty by Nature. And then grandma ends up kicking her out. And that story was actually um, inspired by um, a good friend of mine from college who ended up being my roommate for a couple of years. But when that movie came out, everybody and the press, the whatever, the Q and A's, everyone thought that that was my story and that mm -hmm. that granddad oh, really? yeah. was me. And yeah. people were even, even my friends were saying that she reminded them of me. And I was like, well, but it has nothing to do with me really. And then Almost Perfect, you know, when I did Almost Perfect, then everyone thought, oh, this is, this is autobiographical. This is your family. This is your story. I was like, okay, so which one is it? Am I the, you know, <laughs> daughter yeah. of a deadbeat mom from Chinatown or I'm the uh, upper middle interracial, you know? Yeah. So, um, so, but, but that, the Almost Perfect was actually inspired by a different friend's story. And after her wedding on my flight out of Mexico, that's when the idea came to mind. And so it took a few years for me to, you know, um, develop the script, but the characters, they just, in my mind, they just kept on becoming more and more concrete and vivid. And I just felt like these really flawed, but really lovable and humorous, but also sad, kind of sad characters. They just really grabbed me and I just, wanted to chase after them and tell their story. So that's how Almost Perfect came about. I loved it. I watched it last night and I and I do, I, I thought it was great. And, and I, even, even though obviously I'm not Asian American, but I could relate to a lot of those, because you know, I have totally, you know, so many Asian American friends and I, I've seen that perspective in just lifestyle, so to speak, but I, I loved it. I thought it was great. So, and I don't have to say that you are, you and I already talked about that. I don't have to say that. I just, I appreciate it that I'm a cheesy, She's a guy who uh, who likes romantic comedy, so there you go. I, I like that. My film cheesy. <laughs> no, I said I'm cheesy. I didn't say your film was cheesy. I said I'm cheesy. I'm a cheesy guy. No, your film was great. It made me happy. It, it, it uh, no, it is definitely worth a watch. So I, I'm gonna watch Face tonight. I, I got to be honest with you. I haven't watched it yet, but uh, tonight, no tonight, tonight, I'm gonna watch um, Face as soon as we're done with this. So uh, I don't know if you can see this, but uh, can you see the the writing down? At the Calvin. bottom there, yeah, from Calvin. Yeah. He wants to know. We've got a couple of questions that always, you know, people chime in. I, I welcome yeah. their questions, but he wants to know two questions: with how much social media and live streaming services like Netflix help to bring forth awareness of content from around the world? How do you think this will dwindle racial stereotypes? Ooh, that got deep real quick. Yeah. Um, so that's a great question, and. I don't even know if I'm equipped to answer such a deep and complex question. Um, I do think, yeah, social media, live streaming, um, it definitely brings awareness and continues and is necessary to continue. Um, but but the thing is, there has to be content, right? That that. Mm put on that is helping to further this cause. And so it is in the storytelling and, and being able to tell stories of human beings who may have different skin colors, but finding, 
I think the thing is when you tell a story about some a human being, regardless of what race, what culture, what societal backgrounds or um, religious background they come from, when you tell them from a really human and relatable way, then, and you hone in on the craft of grabbing the audience at hello. So, because these days with everyone's attention span is so short and there's all these distractions, right? So you have to really, um, quoting Jerry Maguire, get one at hello, and you grab them in. And once the audience is in and going through this entire emotional journey with you, they're not gonna be able to pull out and judge. Like, oh, yeah. but that person is black or that person is Asian, that, different from me, you know, but because you're engaging on an emotional level. And so once you're on this emotional journey, immersed with the characters, then you realize, wow, we're actually not that different. And even, I, I would never have imagined that. Or, or you were really, um, entertained and laughing at the same jokes or realizing, oh, we actually share the same awkward or embarrassing moments. Mm -hmm. Oh, who, who would have thunk, right? Yeah, totally. Um, so I think that is better than preaching outright or, mm. um, or using whatever, um, uh, uh, jargons or certain, you know, obviously language is important, but, mm -hmm. but I do think it's like compelling characters, full, like well-crafted storytelling. And yes, then through social media, through streaming, being able, like accessibility, I think is really important, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah, combined, yeah, there is hope. <laughs> no, I like that. Well, let's jump on that that uh, that tale of storytelling. Then, what, in your opinion, what makes a great story? That is a really good question. Um, so, I do think, as as we were just talking about, um, relatability, I think, mm -hmm. is important. And I think, as long as it it's another human being. Then, then there will be relatable traits, right? So, because mm -hmm. deep down, I think we all share the same fundamental longings, and you know, the need to be loved, um, the desire to be fully seen, and and um, some kind of re redemption or hope or second chance or you know, being seen for the fully flawed person that we are and yet so fully loved. I mean, I think all those basic traits um, are the same deep down for any human being. And so mm -hmm. when it's approached from that, um, from that way, then it's going to be an engaging story. And then I think it has to be structured in a way that is engaging throughout, right? Um, so whether it's an advertisement, then maybe it's 30 seconds, you have to tell the story within 30 seconds or mm -hmm. if it's episodic, then 60 minutes or with commercial breaks, it's 52 minutes, right? <laughs> and then, right. You know, right. then feature films, 90 to 120 minutes. So, so being able, and being able to perfect that craft of telling a story within that time frame line, that structure, mm -hmm. and, you know, also, I think when I was prepping face, this mentor, he was telling me, about, he was like, you know, even though it's cinema, but you want to be able to engage all the senses, all five senses. And so he was saying how, when he was reading my script, he's like, okay, you have all these scenes of grandma cooking in the kitchen. So you want to be able to use words that, that really allow the reader to, almost feel like they can smell what grandma's cooking and they or bring them back to what it was like in their own grandma's kitchen and then and then translating that from the page to the screen that's a whole other skill right so i think it's 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 having the patience to really take the time to craft 
the script carefully and use your words and that structure, learn the structure of good storytelling, compelling and reading storytelling, and then also how to translate that from page to screen. So, um, yeah, so compelling characters that are relatable, um, the structure of storytelling is important and, um, and really taking the time to develop the craft. Awesome. Yeah. What about your, your own filmmaking? What is, uh, what's your story development process like in terms of, are you a storyboard person? Are you someone that gets an idea and just can, keeps writing about it? Like, what is, what is it that takes your idea from that idea into film? And you know, what's the, what's that process in between? I know it's kind of a generic question, but what, what do you, what do you do personally? What's, what's your story here or what's your de development process like? Um, every project is quite different sure. not, I, there are certain filmmakers who who are who really have a set method down and mm -hmm. um i for me it's more about the project and so for for face and for almost perfect these were ideas that came from real life characters and their story intrigued me and then throughout the different versions of the script throughout the years, they morphed into their own characters. And then from that, um, structuring it into um, a screenplay format, which took years and years and years of development. And with Face, we even had to bring in a co-writer, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Or Mooverman was brilliant in storytelling structure because with three generations, it was like, at, at, after 10, 12 drafts, I was like, okay, whose story is it now? And how <laughs> are we telling this? And, you know, um, it was getting really confusing. So, so that was with a co-writer, almost perfect. It was just developing for years and then putting it aside and then coming back and then having my manager at the time give notes and then, um, and then revising. So there's that. But then there are also projects where like Lucy in the Sky, um, the writer producer comes to me and I'm the director for hire. So then mm -hmm. I give my script notes and then from a director's perspective, and then we figure out what's the best way to tell the story that she wants to tell and bring it to screen. So, um, yeah, so every project is different and I've directed a few music videos as well. And it's from hearing the song and then writing out a treatment of what, I feel like is a story, visual story that can really enhance the experience of the music, um, yeah. uh, and then draw the storyboards. So, because when I was a kid, when we first moved to Taiwan, I was so angsty and in my head so much that I actually did draw comic books of my own ideal world <laughs> so much, and yeah. so that actually ended up helping me become a director who draws her own storyboards. So see, it all comes back around. I told yeah, you yeah. <laughs> it all comes back around. Yep. What about, and this is just me shooting from the hip here. This isn't one of the questions uh, we previously discussed, but in terms of, and I, and I mean this respectfully ego, when it's something that you have created something that you brought to, you know, the screen or you, even just your writing, you know, when, when you reach that point of someone else is being brought in, how do you put that ego aside and move forward with that? Like, I guess I, that's because as, as a writer, I've, all, I've only done my own stuff. I've never yeah. had anybody else kind of join in. But how do you put that ego aside for the betterment of the project? That's a great question. And it's something that I have actually spent a lot of time thinking about. And also because I've been teaching um, directing online. Um, oh, wow. Well, and so it's something that I also preach to my students, which is, to, to really keep the focus on the big picture. So, mm -hmm. and, and that is we want to be able to tell the best story possible. And so you want to bring in someone who is compatible in terms of the vision of what story you want to tell and then figure out if, if they are better to in, um, Hi Daisy, sorry I got distracted. <laughs> That's all right. Hi Daisy. Yeah. <laughs> she was my big sister when I chatted. There you go. Yes. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Hi um, Daisy. But um, but uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, uh. Um, right. So, so putting one's ego aside, it's, it, yeah, putting a, the ego aside, but ultimately it's serving you, right? Or mm -hmm. me, because if they are able to better bring out the exact story that I want to tell and they can help me, then, and we can collaborate in a way that brings the project, tells the story in a way that was possibly even better than what I had originally concocted from my limited brain. Mm -hmm. So, so I love collaborating with people who actually are so much smarter and better than me because it just it it enhances the project and it yeah. makes the story even better than what I originally had in mind. Yeah, no, I love that, and and that's that's totally true and, and but please don't sell yourself short you're definitely a talented person so yes, that's yes. yeah so I um talented sorry but i, I do think i have mm -hmm. a, a gift of spotting talent and mm -hmm. um and because I, I really have had the good fortune of working with some incredibly incredibly talented and inspiring people but who also i can trust and so we yeah. collaborate really well together. And yeah. so that's another thing is like when you're, when someone else is brought in, it's important that this is someone who actually wants, shares a vision, a similar vision as you, right? And not someone yeah. trying to usurp or, yeah. or prove, have something to prove or, um, you know, compete. Yeah, no, I, I love that because that's that's one thing. Like I said, I'm not on your level, but even with my own writing, I've been yearning for for some somebody to collaborate with, some you know people that understand exactly what I'm trying to get across. Right. And that that's a little bit difficult when you're on your own and, and don't have those connections. But that doesn't mean it's impossible. And I love that concept of collaborating because I do think not you know you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen, but I do think the collaboration for the betterment of a project is something that, you know, is to be desired. You know, I think that can make things better. Even, even, even though you, you know, ego kind of gets in the way sometimes, I don't mean you, I just mean even me. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone, you know, but it's, it's hard to set that aside, but at the end of the day, collaborating may actually make the project better, may actually make the writing better, may actually make every process better. Right. And so that's at the end of the day, that's what you want. You want the best right. thing. So no, I love that. I love that. Cause that's, that's been, not that it's an ego thing. It just, I, I guess when I write, I don't realize that there's other people that can connect to this right away. They, they may not, you know, I'm writing about this stuff. I'm writing about, you know, how can I explain this to the rest of the people? But there are people that do understand the process and maybe reaching out, maybe speaking to them can make the process even better. So. Yeah. And I've also been on the other side, right? So if it's someone mm -hmm. who hired me as a director for hire, but it's their story. So then it's yeah. my job to try to really listen to them and find out what is the story that they're trying to tell and how can I help you with my ex expertise or whatever mm -hmm. experience to help you tell the story that you want to try and tell. So yeah. that there's, you know, that's the other side. Of it. Which I think totally comes across. I, I did watch the, uh, the episode you sent me of Lucy in the Sky. Uh, and I definitely think that comes across. Wow, that was talented, talented everywhere. Everybody's talent. Like I, I was impressed with that. How was Whoopi, by the way? I got a name drop a little bit. How was Whoopi <laughs> Goldberg? <laughs> she was amazing to work uh, with, and it was. She's just. She was very. Um, her energy was very serene, actually, when mm -hmm. she first walked in, and and I think similar to what you and I were talking about mm -hmm. because she had never worked with me before and she's worked with all the greats, yeah. right? So, yeah. Okay. You know, so she walks in and she was very quiet and she, you could tell that she's really observing and taking it all in. And she's also a really good listener and mm -hmm. she asked very specific questions and, um, and, and she was so humble and, once she actually warmed up, then it was really fun too, because then she um, was able to, um, in a way, even help me because she knew um, what I wanted to get out of her scene partner. So she would actually, even though she was off camera, 
she would do certain things. I could tell she was doing certain things to help me get what I needed out of her scene partner. And also she was great at, um, she did actually also, um, I think what was amazing is that after all the awards and all the years of experience that she had, and yet still at one point I, I, I gave her this one note and then I could tell from her facial expression that she didn't look convinced. And so <laughs> I was like, does that make sense? And she said, no, but you're the director, so I'm just gonna do it. And wow. I couldn't believe that she would, if, if I hadn't prompt her, she mm -hmm. wouldn't have said anything. But then I said, no, but I would really like to know what you think. And so mm -hmm. only after I asked that she um, shared what her reason behind how she had done the previous take um, was. And when I heard it, it actually made more sense to me. And so I asked the writer producer to listen in and got her approval. And we both agreed that, oh, this is actually what Whoopi was explaining actually made so much more sense. And it just enriched the material and her character and made it better. So, so you know, but the thing is like, I had to be the one asking her. She wasn't inserting her experience, even though it was a better idea, right? So that was that was a great learning experience as well for me. Yeah. Hi, Linda. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Linda's on, yeah. She must be having some connection issues here. Sorry, Linda. Um, but that's refreshing to hear regarding somebody of that, I guess, caliber and, and that background and whatnot. So status, so to speak, but that's, that's refreshing to hear. And I love that. I, I want to make sure we, we say that too, that Lucy in the sky. Now, was, I guess I was a little bit confused. Was that a TV show or was that a, it's a, it, it's, um, it's a proof of concept. Okay. So the pilot script is actually for a half hour series and mm -hmm. we took 12 minutes out of the half hour series to, to showcase and hopefully get interest for yeah. series to get picked up. Well, I saw it, it, it like, again, you and I talked about this before I, I was, I, you know, I still consider myself a teacher educator. I guess I always will. I'm not doing that right now, but I saw it from the eyes of a teacher. I saw it from, I saw it from kind of Whoopi's character. Not that I taught drama or anything like that, but I, and, and I've had those kids, I've had those kids that, you know, a little misfit, you know, um, on the spectrum, so to speak, you right. know, and it's, it's definitely a, a moving piece. And I, you know, from a parent standpoint, you know, I'm not a parent, but I can't, I, you know, what a, that's a tough gig, right? That's a tough gig, but I, that's why I appreciated it so much that I love Whoopi's character and the ability to interact and, and treat her as human, you know, yeah. and I love that side of things. And, and I appreciated that from a teaching aspect. I appreciated yeah. that th there was somebody there who was almost advocating for that kid, you know, mm. And uh, yeah. I love that, you know, and what without, a tough spot for that sister to be in too. Sorry, go ahead. Without, she was what you said, but without being overt about it, which I thought mm -hmm. would have been more brilliant. Yeah, no, I loved it. And, and and what a tough spot for the sister to be in because she's she's coming into her own as well. Yeah. Right? And yet she has, she doesn't hate her, but it's hard to kind of deviate from her own life and she's got this kind of twin sister that yeah i just i love the concept of it you know I, I saw it just made me reflect on my own you know almost 18 years in the education industry or business or whatever you want to call it i could reflect so many times i saw so many like of my former students in those moments and i was just like wow. even the mean girls i was like i looked at her like you know not to, to be ruder you know but i just remember like getting to go to bitch and yet that's so true of how you know, in today's world and not yeah. just today, it's just always how, how it's been, but they're like, what a good actor. Cause that girl's like, she's spot on. If I saw it, you know, teaching sixth grade for so long, yeah. it was always, it was the mean girls, the guys just, you know, they, they were stinky kids and always want to go outside to recess. That's all boys wanted to do at the time. But it was that the girls were just so brutally mean. And even at that age, I mean, I know they're supposed to be in high school, but I just remember looking back thinking like, I went through this, I saw this, you know, it was just, but it was spot on just so you know, as someone who was a teacher for so many years it was spot on so thank you i'll, I'll yeah. let the creator know she'll be really pleased. yeah 
Yeah, but uh, especially because I mean, you don't get a perfect class, you don't get perfect students, and and I welcome that. You know, maybe that's my TCK background because I didn't want the same same kids every year in and out. You know, you, it doesn't make it always easy, but you would definitely get kids like Lucy. You know, and it was just one of those things that I just reflected so well to. I, like I said, I, I'm not putting myself and I'm not trying to say I'm like Whoopi's character, so to speak, but I just saw those kids. I, I know yeah, the struggles and the frustrations, you know, dealing with the home lives, dealing with, you know, trying to get them adapted to normality, you know, mainstream, yeah. things like that. I, I love that. I mean, it was it was short and sweet, but it, it, that hit me more than obviously Almost Perfect was just it was a fun movie. It's a great movie. But it was I hit I re reflected and related more to Lucy in the Sky, even though it was, you know, it was a short little yeah you know, thing but it was it was a, as a teacher a former teacher i hope those that are watching that are in the education industry you know definitely watch that because that's that's something that needs to be seen because that is it's true it, that was life to me that was real life to me so thank you thanks yeah the, um actually the that's that's really rewarding to hear you say that and yeah we also got um one of the advisors of the film she's the head of nyu child Develop child psychology and mm -hmm. um, autism. I'm ma I'm mangling her title, but and, yeah. and autism um, research. And she, after she came to the premiere and watched it, she she said on the podium that she felt like she was sitting in her office, and these mm -hmm. were the same people who were in her office yeah. throughout the years. And I was like, that's the best compliment ever. Oh. And these what? are all actors, right? And yeah. so well, that's what I was going to ask you. That the girl that played Lucy or plays Lucy is, is she? She's not on the spectrum. She's acting, right? She's not. Yeah, Zoe Coletti. She's wow. actually um, one of the lead actresses in the latest. Um, uh, what is it? Secrets, things, stories you tell, scary stories you tell in the dark. Is that best? Sure. <laughs> I'll have to look that one up. Yeah big film from yeah. uh, and and yeah she's she's done a ton of she's an incredible actress she's yeah. so brilliant and she's well, doing really well too being yeah she she had that down and, and like i said i've had so many students throughout the years on that level on that spectrum even down to when she was biting on her her, her shirt her sweatshirt i just kept thinking like i had so many kids that would do just little you know things like that i was just like wow i feel like i'm watching what i just went through the last 18 years so it's oh. I, re I, re I totally that that hit right on the mark and that's i meant to tell you that even before we started i would have told you oh. that just face to face but yeah you guys you guys nailed that one nice job yeah, thank you that's yeah. awesome to hear yeah well let's uh let's continue to progress here but let's talk about you uh by the way i don't know if you saw linda's comment there we, we maybe you can answer this any more Try project with christina right. yeah yeah <laughs> She's a hot commodity right now, right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, in terms of growing up, who were your role models as an Asian American, you know, kid growing up, and then you know, first in the states and then overseas? Who was it that you you modeled yourself after, wanted to to be like? Um, I really don't know. <laughs> okay. No, that's fair too. That's fair too. Yeah, I. I I honestly can't really remember. I mean, I don't know if I've had specific role models that I mm -hmm. that I personally wanted to emulate, but um, but I had a ton of mentors and teachers and advisors and people who somehow saw something in me that was beyond uh, what my grades were showing. <laughs> yeah. That's so, by the way, that's so refreshing to hear because I was the same way. Yeah, I was the same way. So. Yeah, and so including the professor I was just mentioning who, yeah. who, who who's originally didn't get what my language barrier was about. I mean, he yeah. was the one who somehow, even though I was flunking his course and I was on academic probation, but somehow he... Um, after hearing more about my background and 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 my sharing my story, he somehow um, his name is Dr. Keith Botsford. He's no longer with us, but um, he somehow 
gathered that I don't do well in a structured academic situation. And so he yeah. actually recommended me to this program called the University Professors Program where the, the GPA required to get into that program was something like close to 4.0 and mine, I don't know, was like 1.7 or two, something yeah. on, on the opposite spectrum. But then um, he convinced them to hear me out. And so that program basically is a two-year program where you can take courses from anywhere in the world and travel and do whatever you want as long as you develop, um, you deliver before graduation. It's, it's almost like grad school, a dissertation that that um, is the project proposal that you got in with. And so I ended up getting into that program, doing this thesis paper and making a short film. And it definitely, I mean, I couldn't even, I, I don't think I, at the time, um, it really, I, I really understood the impact that his, that one conversation with him, how it's changed the whole course of my life and how it impacted it because I could have just been a flunky in this structured academic system that I couldn't really thrive in and be unhappy and feel like a failure. And instead I got into this special gifted program and got to do all these things freely and learn from all these top scholars and artists and great thinkers. And it's just, it's just mind blowing to me now when I think back and I'm so grateful. That's, that's a mark of a good teacher too, right? Sees those shining yeah. stars, yeah. And I, and I kept on, and I got that at Columbia too, same thing mm -hmm. with, um, with my professor there, it was um, James Seamus who was the writer and producer of Ang Lee's early films. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he was also the founder of, at the time, Good Machine um, Film Production Company. And then for a few years, he was the head of Focus Features Studio. Um, so at the time, he was when he was teaching at Columbia, I actually failed his midterm exam. And, but in, but he, meanwhile, he is already this big producer, screenwriter, traveling to film festivals and making movies. And he's a busy man. And yet he wanted to know why I failed. So he actually made me schedule a sit down appointment with him. <laughs> and, and at one point he makes me open up my notebook. And I'm like, I'm already working in the real world and you wanna look at how I take notes. And yeah. he looked at my notebook and he's like, this is why you're not keeping up with the terminologies in class. And so he actually taught me to like draw a line in the middle of my notebook and then every single word because he's lecturing really quickly. So he's like, every single word, new word that I hear, the new term, write it down. And then on the other column, write down the definition of it. And that just makes it easier and faster to take notes and yeah. also to review. And then, you know, and, and of course, during that meeting, I also, being the punk that I was back then, <laughs> Oh, by the way, um, great films that you make with Aang, but um, but somehow the Chinese subtitles, they don't quite express, I mean, the English subtitles, they're not quite accurate of what the Chinese complexity of, of the dialogue. So, yeah. you know, if you ever need a subtitler, you know, I used to, that used to be my side job <laughs> in Taiwan. You know, just let me know yeah. and I, I can do it for you. And then he just looks to me deadpan, he goes, all of the scripts, the original dialogue was written in English by me, and then they did the Chinese. Oh, country. wow, <laughs> really? Oh, wow, too. <laughs> yeah. But for some, but even as this punk, he just took the extra time with me, and then with my final paper, I had to turn him because I was already traveling so much for work. Um, I kind of just phoned it in to put you know, to have something to turn in. And then he rejected it and he was like, I know you can do better. 
I want you to go into the library, do the research. This is an interesting topic that you chose to write about. So do the work, do the research. I will give you an extension. And if you have to travel for work, do it after you come back. But I won't fail you, but you know, you have to do the work. And so, and then he gave me a lot of specific advice. So eventually I was like, huh, I think it was the first time I had ever walked into the Columbia Library. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I turned in yeah. the paper and one day I came home and I got an, a message from him back when there were answering machines. Yeah. I got a message from him and he said, your paper was so good. I knew you had it in you. I knew you would be able to do it. And I was, it was good enough for me to want to give you an honors for the whole class. But since wow. you failed the midterm exam, yeah. so the grading system, the school would not allow it. But I wanted yeah. you to know that it was good enough to get an honors. And, you know, it, he, he's a busy man. He could have just given me a D and moved yeah. on. And yet he took the time to, because he wanted me to be better because he somehow saw that in me. Really so cared. You know, it's again, like yeah. teachers, he, <laughs> teachers, right? Yeah, you care. Yeah. He saw something in you, and that's that's what it's about. So I love that. Great story. Hi, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, Taylor. Taylor just joined. What's up, Taylor? Uh, what about your your parents and family? Were they always supportive of your your dreams, especially as you started to really make a name for yourself in the film industry? Um, they've always been supportive, but also concerned as mm -hmm. any yeah. loving parent would be um, yeah. because the entertainment industry, especially when I started out, it's, it was a, something very foreign. It was not, there were no, um, other than Ang Lee, there were no um, quote unquote successful Asian filmmakers with, you know, telling wholesome or whatever stories that mm -hmm. that um did well so and it was a colorful industry because they only knew what was written in the tabloids or they don't read tablets but whatever in the yeah. newspapers and and also because it's freelance and it's also it's, it's just not stable right so mm -hmm. um and and there's no rhyme or reason to it you can do really well and still not have the next gig lined up so mm -hmm. yeah so they've always been concerned and trepidatious but also very supportive and and proud that's awesome they should be yeah what do you what do you think the biggest and this one's kind of a deep question but what do you think the biggest misconception or stereotype is in the film industry especially with asian american and especially asian american women what you know what would you like to see change maybe too so it's kind of a double-edged double-edged question there so um I I don't know if I can speak for an entire um, race or gender mm -hmm. or um, or industry, but I think I can only go by what I have personally experienced. Um, and for me, I have always, to my to the probably detriment. Um, I have never wanted to emphasize, you know, that I'm a female director or that I'm an Asian American director or Taiwanese, Chinese, whatever. I wanted to be recognized as the best person for the job. Love and that. So, Love that. Yeah. Which is not every job, right? Yeah. It's, and so I remember when Columbia, uh, when I received the Directors Guild of America Award, and mm -hmm. when they told me, when my professor told me about the nomination, it was like, I saw the categories. It's like, okay, so it's the Directors Guild of America Award. And the categories were best female director, best Asian American director, best Latino director, and best African American director. So I was like, that, so, so wow, I didn't even get into the second tier of best female, I'm in mean, the third tier, best Asian American, for me, right? So, and so I didn't know during the award ceremony that I had to give a speech. <laughs> so when I went up there, yeah. asked to give a awards acceptance speech. I was just like, uh, I appreciate the awards money. And hopefully one day I can just be recognized as the best 
director award no is you know no yeah. category period and unfortunately all these years later it's still by category and and i but the thing is i think it's so ingrained even you know i'm guilty of it too i was thinking about it today when i was preparing about you know just thinking mm -hmm. about what we were going to talk about tonight and i was remembering how um after we wrapped my second feature at the wrap party of course you know there's free flow alcohol so <laughs> everyone had less filter and one of the key crew members came up to me um who is a woman and and you know people were all excited and it was a great experience everyone's happy and so she said she's like you know i'm so impressed by how you handled yourself throughout this shoot you know because the whole time i was standing by like ready to you know and it never happened and so i know she meant it as a compliment and she yeah. really meant well and she is also a strong talented woman herself but but this was already my second feature at this point and my first feature you know won all these awards was a new york times critics pick and a lot of my same people came on to this movie so they already would have been able to attest that i'm not you know my reputation whatever mm. was being unflappable on set not because i'm so holier than thou but because i just enjoy i love being yeah. on set and working with awesome people so much right so but anyway but you would never have said that to a male director right no it's and a back-ended compliment the yeah. big boss in yeah. a way it's like you would yeah. never say that to the boss yeah. but then i then two years later i was in taiwan for another gig and um and the boss who brought me over he um he he made me move to taiwan and then left me in the dark for all these months during development and so i put together this email of like can we just meet face to face and discuss these bullet points because i know you're busy so here it is in advance so you can prepare and you know we can talk it out and he just kept on dodging i think he was that he, i found out years later that he was going through stuff with the funding of the project but he wouldn't face me and mm -hmm. he was dodging meetings and didn't reply to my emails or texts and just left me in the dark this whole time and eventually he sent someone else to come meet me he didn't even show up so mm -hmm. one day i'm just complaining to my mother and i was like god you know why can't he just be a man about us it? like he's acting like such a chick and then my <laughs> mom was like why couldn't you just say why can't he just do the right thing? He's being cowardice. You are assigning these stereotypes by gender and you're actually insulting the whole of women by, because he's doing something cowardice and unprofessional and then you're assigning that as a chick. And so she was like, just say he was being cowardice and unprofessional. And, and it dawned on me like, oh my gosh, this is ingrained in my own language too. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, and it really struck me and it really humbled me. So I think that's a long roundabout answer that I feel like we really, it's not about race, skin color, gender, sexual preference. It's, it's about just doing the job that you been given this privilege to do and do the best your like give your best give your 200 percent and not let it my ideal world would be that it's not about skin color or gender or you know who you're oh, i love that no i i totally can understand that and relate to that i, I love that answer actually um unfortunately whether you realize it or not you are a role model to a lot of young girls growing up okay whether i know you don't want to get into specifics and gender and all that you just talked about that but the reality is you are a role model and a you know you're someone who's kind of paved the way for a lot of young girls specifically 
who, and I know you want to see it as director and, and I'm with you on that, but the reality is you are a trendsetter for a lot of these young girls who are trying to, you know, see their dreams bigger than who they are right now. They see someone like you who's doing it. They see someone like you who's made it, right? What kind of advice would you give to those those young girls specifically that want to follow in your footsteps? Um, well, first of all, thank you for the kind compliments. Yeah. I don't know if I've made it. <laughs> oh, you have. You have, definitely have. So. But um, yeah. well, I think it's um, it's to just be not dissimilar to what you were asking for me to share a, for future or TCK kids, which is mm -hmm. to really be open-minded and observe and take in all the experiences and really live life and experience life and be present. And um, actually this quote I love and I use all the time, it's by, and you're a writer, so you probably know yeah. um, this author, Anne Lamott, her book, mm -hmm. Bird by Bird. And so she was describing how um, she noticed that she became a better writer after she had her child and saw the world through her three-year-old son's eyes because everything was like oh, a plane. <laughs> yeah. And so she was like, oh, I realized that that's how we're supposed to see the world is to be present and in awe. And so, and she said so many writers herself included prior to that had their have their heads stuck so far up their own arses that <laughs> the only view of the world that they have yeah. are their own rectal hollow views. And that really struck a chord with me too, because mm -hmm. I think growing up, whether it's writing music or writing stories, it was like, oh yeah, I want people to understand me and my world. But actually the most interesting characters and the most interesting stories are in life itself. And instead of being in one's own head, to live life, engage in life, engage with all these rich human characters and live life so that you can tell a story that is relatable to fellow human beings, regardless of what kind of race or cultural or religious or political background that they come from. So I think that's what I would say. And then, you know, roll with the punches. You just never know, you know, as long as you stay, stand strong and don't yeah. knock, like get knocked down and then just, you know, when it's time to get back up, get back up. All of that actually just enriches you as a storyteller and you can use all of that and just tell stories of even, you know, my favorite stories are always actually with when the protagonist is an underdog. So my dream is to make a sports film. <laughs> it has been for a long time. Okay. We'll talk after the show, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, so just take it all in and, and then keep on being patient and honing in on the craft. Yeah. But also to know why you want to become a filmmaker. It's, it, you know, to, to tell stories, to communicate, to bridge the gaps or, you know, to give voice to people who don't have a voice or to reveal the brokenness that people usually shove under the rug. Whatever it is, know why you want to be a filmmaker and enjoy the process because the, the results are too unpredictable in our industry. And so if it's about, you know, what you see in magazines with red carpets and awards and evening gowns or being able to come home and in a limo with the supermodel and say, look, I finally made it. That's, you know, then that's a whole different route. Um, and it's a route that I obviously don't know how to, <laughs> how to um, achieve. That's so. awesome. Uh, I love that. The, uh, the concept of giving voice to people that don't always have a voice that's why I became a teacher, mm. but that's, that's at the same time. That's, those are the people you stand up for, right? The people that can't stand up for themselves sometimes. And I love that, that I love that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, like I said, whether you realize it or not, you are a role model. I mean, there's, there's a lot of young girls that, you know, I don't know necessarily if they're watching this, but maybe know who you are and, and are following you. So 
I appreciate what you're doing and whether that makes you uncomfortable or not, I'm just going <laughs> to tell it like it is. So, uh, well, look, we, we've made it to the end of this and I, I always end these with the same three questions and I, and I hopefully, uh, kind of putting you on the spot here with these three questions, but these are just more fun questions that kind of, you know, that we got deep. We talked about the TCK stuff. We talked about your career. We talked about a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but what, what is something that, you know, people don't know about you? Maybe there's something off the record that, you know, we, we, we all maybe might get to know you a little bit better by you sharing here. So what, what is it something that maybe, like I said, people don't know about you? Well, I don't know what people know, so I don't know what people don't know. <laughs> okay, is there a different different talent you have, or something? You said you play instruments, right? Or you were in a band? Yeah. What did you play? Uh, all the TASers here. Yeah. Probably no, I, I was in a. I had a band at TAS. We played out a lot. Did you um, play the pavilion. Remember the pavilion at the old school? Yeah. 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 So it was with Chester Yang and Zulu, Derek McKay. And Bobby Cha. I remember Bobby and I remember, yeah, so, Derek, totally. Yeah, so we even, I mean, I think some of, I've, a few TASers have even mm -hmm. told me that they still have the cassette tapes of the song <laughs> I wrote and recorded. <laughs> what did you play? Instrument or were you a singer? I guess I don't, I don't um, remember. Singer, songwriter, keyboardist. But in, yeah. bands, in Mr. Salmonen's band, Salmonen. yeah. played bassoon as well <laughs> of course but, you did right? of course you did. Taylor, on, Taylor used to call me Bertha and the bazooka <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome um I love that and Salmanen has watched a few of these and he's chimed in he's in Vietnam now they moved yeah. they, ended, they ended up in Vietnam so uh, a little shout out to Mr. Salmanen because I, I was in band too I played the sax and I played the drums a little bit too so I yeah um yeah, at the old school, the band room was way far in the back, at, in the kind of the elementary side, way far in the back. And I, yeah. So, uh, okay, second question then, kind of to, to wind this down. But if you could sit and have an hour, hour-long conversation with anybody, it doesn't matter if they're still with us or not with us, who would that be and why? Kind of getting a little deep here, but. An hour-long conversation. Yeah. Gosh, my mind is drawing a blank now. There's so many great minds that I'd love to dissect into. So, huh, Michelle Obama. <laughs> great, great answer. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, she's uh, she's pretty badass, so, okay. Okay, and then we'll find it, we'll finalize this with, uh, you know, you, we talked about this earlier, but you're someone who is a traveler and you, you love to take trips anywhere. So where would that one place be that maybe you haven't been to you? Where, if you could take a trip anywhere, where would it be? Well, actually, um, I was supposed to go to New Zealand for the first, Australia and New Zealand for the first time um, in April to celebrate a good friend's birthday. And she's from New Zealand originally. Okay. So, but lockdown happened. And so that trip got canceled. Yeah. So, of course, I still have my plane ticket. So I'm still waiting to lose that. So, yeah, I would love to make that trip eventually. Yeah. No, it'll happen. That's funny. I just talked to my one of my best friends from TAS days is uh, from Auckland, and we actually just we chatted last night. So it's uh, it's funny, yeah, that you brought that up. But yeah, I'd love to get. I've never been to New Zealand or Australia either, so I'd love to, to get there one of these days. So that's that's place in the world right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah, yeah. He they're in, back in lockdown though. They had four new cases, four, in the whole country, but they're back in lockdown, which, which is smart. You know, I I, I actually think that's smart. So. Hey, we made it. I told you this was going to go by fast. It's uh, an hour 45-ish. But uh, listen, I, I can truly not thank you enough for doing the show. This is uh, this has been a treat. And uh, I just, you know, as a TAS person to a TAS person, as an artist to an artist, I admire what you're doing so much. And I know people that are watching will back me up on that. You are kicking ass and taking names and, and keep doing it. So it's, uh, I appreciate what you're doing. So Same to you. And thank you asking all these poignant questions and yeah. influencing and all the teaching that you did. It's, yeah. you know, I was, I'm telling stories of people that are already shaped and formed. You're shaping them. You're <laughs> shaped and formed. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, even more important. I appreciate that. Yeah. Then there's a lot of, a lot of teachers right now that are in a, in a, in a tough spot. So I, I, my hats off to them. So especially whether they're going back to school or not going back to school. Yeah. yeah. 
just uh, support your teachers, folks. Whoever's watching, support your teachers. So, uh, but listen, Bertha, yeah, just uh, please keep in touch. This is this has been a treat, and I and I really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's getting kind of late on your end. It's almost eleven, I guess. Maybe that's as an artist. That's the, the my brother used to go out at midnight. I'd be falling asleep, and my brother would go out when he'd be going out. So I, I respect that. But uh, thank you. Thank and again, uh, yeah, thanks for doing this. And stick around. I'm gonna I'm gonna end off or end this right now. But stick around because I'm gonna. I want to chat real quick before we completely go, but I'm going to end the movie. <laughs> What's that? What's that? that? Movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. You brought it up. Now that's your <laughs> fault, not mine. So, but uh, those of you that are watching, thank you so much. Whether you watched on Facebook, whether you watched on YouTube, if you did watch on YouTube, click that little button that says subscribe. I appreciate that. But Brenda, <laughs> Brenda, I did it. I knew I was, I was trying so hard. Typo autocorrect. That was, that was, I tried so hard. I was, I kept warning, like telling myself, I even wrote it on my notes, like, don't call her Brenda. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Bertha. Yeah, there we go. Bertha. But no, the, the, those of you that are watching, when I first reached out to her, I, I put Brenda down and it was an autocorrect. It wasn't because my phone didn't recognize Bertha. And then I didn't realize what I did till after I sent it. And I was like, oh crap. So, but yeah, here we go. I was so worried about calling you Bertha the whole entire time too. All over my notes, it says, you know, okay. Anyway, thank you for doing the show. I do, I do appreciate it. Those of you that are watching, thank you for watching. Until next time, we we uh, have another show next Sunday and we have a show after that, the following Sunday that are going to be good too. But uh, Bertha Penn, award-winning director, TAS alum, all around badass. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, you're, you're a rock star. So we will uh, we will chat with you soon. Okay. But stick around. Those of you who are watching, thanks again. This has been episode 21 of Ben There. We'll see you next time. Be uh, Just be humble, be kind, and, and we'll see you next time. Take care.